And, uh, but I want to share with you something I thought was kind of funny. Uh, nine things that women uh, are thankful for and what they understand. And uh, so you may find this funny as well. And uh, I'm thankful for this because women understand. Here's number nine. Women understand why it's good to have five pairs of black shoes. Yeah, I don't get it, but women do. Number eight, women understand the difference between cream, ivory, and off-white. Right, Deborah? I know you do. My sister made a color chart for me when I was a teenager. I don't know why, but maybe I'd put on something that was really bad. Number seven, women understand that crying can be fun. I'm not to see men don't get it. Women understand the phrase, that's my fat clothes. Yeah, only women laughed on that one. The men didn't even laugh. You better not laugh. Husbands. (laughs) Husbands. <laughs> Women understand a salad, a diet drink, and a hot fudge sundae make a balanced lunch. <laughs> now that's my lunch right there, man. That'd be good. Woo. Yeah. Women understand discovering a designer dress on the clearance rack. Honey, I only paid a penny for it. Okay. But I only paid a penny for it. I mean, that's, that's the big thing. Ten cents. Amen. It had a dot on it. It was the red dot. Women understand the inaccuracy of every bathroom scale every ma- ever made. Number two, women understand that a good man might be hard to find, but a good hairdresser is next to impossible. <laughs> Hallelujah. That's what I worry about as a good hairdresser. (laughs) That was a joke, Sean. That was a joke. And the number one thing that only women can understand is other women. (laughs) That's funny stuff, man. I like it. Yeah. Men, just as soon as you figure them out, they change. That's just, it's awesome. It's fun to keep something going on all the time. It's great. But I'm thankful. You know, it is a shame that the only time that some people are ever thankful or thankful to God is at a set-aside time, at a time that is set aside, like for Thanksgiving. The theme of thanks is always appropriate, in my opinion, as a Christian, year-round. It shouldn't be just something that's in the month of November. And like I said a few weeks ago, it shouldn't be Thanksgiving. It ought to be thanks living for the Christian. And some people only thank God when things are going great, when they are blessed. And I want to tell you something. The mark of a true spiritual Christian is a person who can give thanks regardless of their circumstances. But sometimes Christians aren't that way. Sometimes Christians have the mentality, you know, that... uh, only when I find favor with God or only when I'm, you know, uh, only when I'm blessed is when I can praise God. And I want you to know that 1 Thessalonians 5.18 says, In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God. And I want you to know that tonight I'm going to show you four things that every born-again believer can thank God for, no matter what your circumstances are. And I hope that you'll remember these four. And I hope that you'll go tomorrow, wherever it may be, with your family, with friends. Maybe it's out of town. I encourage you, maybe get on. uh, Some of you have Facebook. Some of you uh, do uh, Twitter or tweeting. What is it, Donnie? Twitter? Yeah. Twitter. Whatever that is. I'm not sure what that is. All, All I remember that used to tweet was the little yellow bird on, um, what was that cartoon, Melissa? Tweety Bird on, but what's the cartoon with the cat? Sylvester. Who said that? Yeah, Tommy, I knew you'd know. <laughs> Sylvester was always trying to get that bird, wasn't he? Now, I don't know why I'm talking about that. Oh, tweeting. Some of you ought to get on your email, on your Facebook, only after you've been in this book, though. <laughs> and do some tweetering and text mailing and texts, all that good stuff. And you, you ought to encourage people. 
And you ought to give them these four things. You ought to say, you know what I'm thankful for? I'm thankful for these things. And you ought to spread the news. And you ought to spread that out. Why? Because it's important that every one of us are thankful to God for these things. And these are four freedoms that every believer can be thankful for. And every one of them start with the word freedom. And tomorrow as you eat your turkey and stuff yourself with stuffing and, and eat your cranberry sauce and your homemade gravy and mashed potatoes and, and, and sweet potato casserole and, and dinner rolls and, and with mounds of butter on it and, and pumpkin pie or pecan pie or apple pie or carrot cake, cut it out. Boy, it's good. It's getting good. I'm getting hungry already. But whatever you're going to do tomorrow, I want you to think about these things tomorrow. And the first one is this. You and I ought to be thankful to God for the freedom we have to worship and serve God as we please. Amen? We ought to be thankful for the freedom we have to worship God and to serve God as we please. See, you can do this without fear tonight. You can do this without looking over your shoulder, wondering if someone's going to come in the door and arrest you. Why? Because of this great country called America. All because you live in America, you have the right, you have the freedom to worship God and serve God as you please. Or not. Or not. See, we take it for granted because it's all we've ever known. But guaranteed, there are what people or other Christians tonight in the world that if they were brought over here, they would never take it for granted. They would lift up their head to God every single day and thank God that they can worship Him and serve Him without, without cause of being arrested or being thrown in prison or even being uh, 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 persecuted for the name of Christ. I want you to know that sometimes familiarity breeds complacency and here in america they say that we live in the land of the free and we live in the land of the home and the brave but we also live in the land of the plentiful say oh pastor larry my bank account doesn't show that well let me remind you that if you have any children the bible says that children are an inheritance of the lord the bible says if you have a wife that you findeth a good thing and obtaineth favor from God. Listen, you are blessed all because you live in this wonderful country called America. And it's not that you have to find something. You don't have to find something to be thankful for. You just ought to have a grateful heart as a Christian because of what God's done in your life. You know, I think of tonight that some people knock America. And I resent that. I resent any person who calls themselves of America and then complains and tears down America and rips America apart. I'm offended by it. And I'm going to tell you something. In my opinion, let them pack up and move. Amen. Now, you say, well, Pastor Larry, that's not very Christ-like. Well, let me tell you something. I think an ungrateful Spirit is what's unchristlike. And the Bible says, only by pride cometh contention. And when you meet a contentious person, and when you come across a person who was always wanting to strive and always have an argument or always wanting to raise, uh, raise their fight or raise their issue up on the flagpole, can I tell you something? It's a pride issue. And if you don't like it, move. There are plenty of the countries that do not have the freedom in which we have to worship and serve God as we please. I'm reminded tonight about, and I've spent much time there, about the kids in Peru. I've adopted two of them. And what I'm reminded about, no matter how little that they have, whether in Peru, whether in Africa, whether in Korea, whether in Vietnam, do you know that those families always seem to be happy? Yet they have nothing. Yet they have a smile on their face. And they're very content with their lifestyle. Can I tell you why? Because we're consumed with material. We're consumed with possessions. We can't be happy. Why? Because we're not content, as the Bible says, in every state that we're in. 
Paul says, I've learned to be content. Whatever state I'm in, I've learned to be content. What about you tonight? I want you to know I'm thankful for the freedom that I have to worship and serve God as I please. I've been reading a book entitled Tortured for Christ. You may say, well, why are you reading that on the day before Christmas or Thanksgiving? Well, I'm hoping this will stir you up a little bit to see how thankful that you should really be. This book is nothing new. It's something that was published in 1967. It was written by Richard Wormbrandt, who was a Romanian pastor who endured 14 years in captivity only for sharing the gospel with his communist enemies. His miraculous survival and release sent him from his homeland to the United States to act as the pleading voice of his martyred brothers and sisters for the ears of the Western church. Those sufferings that are mentioned in his book include standing in a freezer near to the point of death, then thawed only to be repeatedly refrozen. He takes an account of lying all day in a box of nails that pierced the body with the slightest movement and then taking communion with human excrement as the elements. My friend, there are people across America who are being tortured for the name of Christ, yet we will not stand up in the church. We will not go out in the community and preach the gospel all because we are not thankful for America where we can worship and serve God as we please. And you ought to get that book. And you ought to read it. Tortured for Christ. And you ought to put it in your library. And you ought to read it. And you ought to read it. And you ought to read it. And you ought to weep while you read it. Why? Because in America, we're so worried about what other people think of us. When there are people who are willing to go to jail, go to even their death for the name of Christ. And we won't walk, knock on a door because we're afraid someone will shut it in our face. And I'm going to tell you, right before the day of Thanksgiving, I have a lot more to be thankful for. All because of reading that book. He made a statement. He says, you free Christians are part of the same body of Christ that is now beaten in other prisons that now gives martyrs for Christ, that are now martyrs for Christ. And he says, can you not feel our pain?" With this challenge comes an inspiring testimony to the truth and the power of the gospel that sustained and motivated every tortured Russian and won their enemies for God. He, re, he writes about miraculous stories of conversions and salvations that dominate the book. Courageous tales of love for Christ so strong. He even makes mention of a wedding ring that was sold to buy a copy of the Bible. And communist persecutors were led to salvation in the homes of their victims. What would you give up for Christ? What would you give up for your church? Would you give up your Thanksgiving dinner? Say, oh, Pastor Larry, please. No, I'm afraid we haven't given up anything in a very long time. Christians still suffer for their faith in 38 restricted and 14 hostile nations across the world. Countries like Cuba, countries like Korea, China, Vietnam, and Ethiopia have been restricted for more than 30 years from the gospel. Yet people will give their lives and sell themselves out for Christ to go there and lay their life down all for the cause of Christ. Yet we sit in our seats watching the news and the media complaining about the state of America. Are you thankful for America? Put your politics aside. Put your, put your what side of the party that you may stand on doesn't really matter at this point. What really matters is, are you thankful for the freedom that you have to worship and serve God as you please? I'm reminded tonight about Muslims attacking a church on October 31st. 
Islamic extremists attacked worshipers, killing 59 Christians and severely injuring more than 80 others. Several gunmen armed with automatic weapons and explosives entered into the church during a worship service and opened fire on worshipers. Two priests were among those that were killed in the attack. The church was attacked because they are very active, especially among the youth and community. They're very uh, active and were persecuted because they distributed Bibles and action packs in Iraq. This is the second time this church has been targeted and since 2004 where it was hit with a car bomb. And yet we debate on whether we should even go to church when the doors are open. A militant organization called the Islamic State of Iraq, Al-Qaeda in Mesopotamia, claimed responsibility for this attack. They don't even deny it. Following the attack, sources from Voice of the Martyrs is where I got this. You can look it all up on the internet. Voice of the Martyrs. That churches throughout the city have received death threat letters warning them to stop their Christian activities and or face similar consequences. The threats have caused many churches to cancel their services. We'll cancel them if it rains hard. And we worry about the snow and the ice and I haven't been around that for years. But I tell you what, if I can get to this building, the doors will be open. You can count on that. I'm reminded on October 2008, more than a dozen Christians were killed in Mosul during a two week period, and more than 2,000 families fled the city all because of the attacks at a Christian church. In Pakistan, Asia Bibi was given a death sentence on November the 8th. She was arrested by police on June 19th and was charged with blasphemy as she engaged in a religious discussion with co-workers. Many of the Muslim women had pressured Asia to renounce Christianity and accept Islam. Her family is one of only three Christian families in a village of more than 1,500 families. On June 19th, When the arrest happened, there was an intense discussion among the women about their faith. And the Muslim women told Asia about Islam. And Asia responded by telling those women that Christ died on the cross for her sins. She told them that Jesus is alive and our Christ is the true prophet of God, as she reportedly told them. And because of that and because of her response, the Muslim women became angry and began to beat her. Some men took her out and locked her in a room. They announced from the mosque loudspeakers that she had been punished by having her face blackened and being paraded through the village on a donkey. Christians there had urged the police not to file blasphemy charges. But the police there claimed that they had to go forward because of pressure from the local Muslim leaders. I'm reminded about the pastor who faces prison in Turkmenistan who was sentenced to four years in prison on October 21st and he will likely be sent to a labor camp. He had been alleged having drug addiction and the prison had been caused him or caused him to have psychiatric problems. And those close to the pastor are very concerned for his health. And the Christians there said that the pastor, who is a diabetic, looked very pale and thin at his trial. They said that the prosecution's witnesses were not credible and that the whole thing was clearly set up. And at the trial, he was surrounded by secret police who even prevented his wife from approaching him that day. I'm reminded on October the 20th that police detained a prominent Christian lawyer who's the leader of the Chinese Christian Church or Christian Legal Defense Association. A group of police reportedly entered his home last Wednesday on that date and prevented him from leaving. 
When they blocked his exit, he struggled through the doorway, but then police shoved him and assaulted him, causing him to sprain his ankle and other injuries. And at the last report, he is still being held there in prison. Authorities will not provide any information why he was arrested to his wife or to anyone else, and they will not negotiate with any authority figure. Christians in Iran are reporting that a pastor has been sentenced for death or to death for is what is called a fault crime. Pastor Youssef, a leader in the full gospel church of Iran, is one of several members of a church who have been imprisoned. The Iranian government, who has also threatened his wife with life imprisonment, has threatened to take over their two children, who are currently being cared for by relatives. After he was arrested in October, after protesting a decision by the government requiring that his son study the Quran, he protested it and they threw him in jail. If a death sentence is officially handed down by the court and Pastor Yusuf is executed, executed, he will be the first judicial execution of a Christian in Iran in two decades. Folks, that's happening today. The arrest and the latest of series of arrests of believers in Iran of the past year have been 83 Christians. Of those, 65 were subsequently released, but 18 of them are still in custody today. And yet we won't thank God for our freedom to worship Him and serve Him in America. So not only should we be thankful and have a thankful heart to God because of our freedom to worship and to serve God as we please, but secondly and very quickly... You ought to be thankful for and can be thankful that you have the freedom from your past. You are freed from your past. I'm reminded in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, the Bible says, If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Praise God that his blood applies to us. He wipes our slate completely clean. He gives you a fresh clean start all the sins that you've committed and i have committed before salvation were washed away by the blood of jesus never to be remembered again by god i'm reminded in isaiah 43 25 i even i am he that blotteth out thy transgressions for mine own sake and will no more remember thy sins my friend you can thank god tonight and you can thank god tomorrow all because your past has been wiped clean i want to remind you that some people live their whole life in guilt and frustration because of some sin they've committed Maybe you feel that way tonight. Maybe you think you come into church tonight and you think, man, there's no way God can forgive me. If only you could realize that in Jesus Christ, there is forgiveness and freedom from all your past sins and failures. Only Jesus can take a murderer. Only Jesus can take a blasphemer. Only Jesus can take a persecutor of the Christians. And make him a proclaimer of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that's the Apostle Paul. Only Jesus can take a harlot and a prostitute and make her pure. Only Jesus can take a maniac of Gadara and make him in his own right mind. Only Jesus can take a dead man and raise him up to new life. My friend, that's what you need tonight. If you're not in Christ, you are a dead man and you need to be raised to life through Jesus Christ. I'm reminded in Acts, if you would, just go to your Bible really quick to Acts chapter 8. I'm reminded that only Jesus can take a hateful, anger-filled man and turn him into a man that is gentle and who is sensitive to the needs of others. Only Jesus can take a drunkard and make him sober. Only Jesus can take an addict and make him clean. Only Jesus can take a sinner and make him a saint. (laughs) Woo! 
I'm reminded in Acts chapter 8, verse 3, as for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering into every house and hailing men and women, committing them to prison. In chapter 9, verses 1 and 2, and Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slander against the disciples of the Lord, went unto the high priest and desired of him letters to Damascus, to the synagogues, that if he found any of this way of the Christians, whether they be men or women, he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. But then he met Christ on the road to Damascus, and Jesus asked him, Why do you persecute me, Paul or Saul? And then Saul rose up and he said, Lord, Lord. And he recognized that he was Lord. And he recognized that he was wrong and that he was a sinner and that he needed Christ. And then in verse 20 of chapter 9, and it says in straightway, he preached Christ in the synagogues that he is the son of God. Here's a murderer, a blasphemer, someone who will take men and women and children from their home and drag them out in the streets to commit them to prison. And then in the same chapter, be in the churches, in the synagogues, preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. My friend, that's the freedom you have from your past. The same freedom that Saul, who, whose name was changed to Paul, had from his past, you can have the same freedom. I'm reminded in chapter 9 where it says that, but all that heard him were amazed and said, Is this not or is not this he that destroyed them, which called on his name in Jerusalem and came hither for that intent that he might bring them bound unto the chief priest? They couldn't believe what they were seeing. Verse 23, And after that many days were fulfilled, the Jews took counsel to kill him. Same ones that he was trying to kill. Now he's preaching the gospel and now they want to kill him. Verse 26, and when Saul was come to Jerusalem, he is said to join himself to disciples. But they were all afraid of him. They knew who he was in his past and believed not that he was a disciple. Listen, there may be people in your past. There may be people at your work. There may be people that live in your community that may not believe that you are, you're in Christ and that you're a new creature. But my friend, don't let, it, don't let yourself be dismayed. Listen, Christ has freed you from your past. And I'm reminded in verse 29, And he spake boldly in the name of the Lord Jesus and disputed against the Grecians, but they went out to slay him. And even though he preached the gospel, they still wanted to kill him. But I'm reminded tonight that I have the freedom to worship and serve God as I please. I have the freedom from my past. But number three, I also have freedom from my sin. A lot of times people say, well, I could become a Christian, but I want my freedom, and I want to do what I want to do. But my friend, what you don't know is that you are a slave and you are not free. You are held captive by the sin chains, and all you are is a yes man to Satan. Romans 6, 17 says, ye were the servants of sin. Verse 20 says, for when ye were the servants of sin. John 8, 34 says, whosoever committed sin is the servant of sin. My friend, you are not free if you're not in Christ. You are a servant. You are not free. Just like a drug addict that is addicted to drugs. They are slaves to it. They are addicted to the sin. They cannot quit. Only a Christian has freedom from sin. They are the only ones that can make a choice and can be their own man. I'm reminded that in Romans 6, 18 and verse 22, the Bible says, being made free from sin, I am made free from sin, that I should no longer serve it, but serve a living and true God. A Christian isn't bondage in any longer. The blood of Jesus is the only thing that can break the chains of sin. Only through the precious shed blood of Jesus, the Bible says, is the remission of sins. You cannot get around it. You cannot get through it through the church. You cannot get to it through religion. You can only do it through the Son of God, Jesus Christ. Are you, are you thankful for the freedom you have? Freedom to worship and serve God as you please? Freedom from your past? Freedom from your sin? And fourthly, 
I'm thankful for this. In Romans 8, 2, the Bible says, For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus, now listen, hath made me free from the law of sin and death. I want you to know tonight that I'm thankful because I'm free from death and hell. I've been made free from the law of sin of death. Oh yes, my body may decay and I will die according to your human eye. But I won't really be dead. I'll be just in heaven. And this body may decay and it's decaying even now as I'm talking. But I want you to know there's coming a day where I won't die. I'll just change locations from this earth to heaven. Why? Because God and his son has conquered death and the hell. And you can too, my friend. But it only comes through Jesus Christ. See, my citizenship is in heaven. According to Ephesians 2, 19. How'd you get this citizenship? Well, it's not like getting a citizenship in America where you are just born into it of no choice of your own. Oh, you can choose to come to America and take on the citizenship of America. But for a person who becomes a citizenship of heaven. The only person that can give it to you is the person of Jesus Christ. John 14, 6 says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. John three thirty six says, He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, and he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. First John five twelve says, He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. My friend, you can't give Get to heaven on your own strength of your own merit. You must do it through Jesus Christ and him alone. And that citizenship is by birth. And that birth is through the spiritual birth. John 3, 7 reminds us that you must be born again. Marvel not that I say unto thee, you must be born again. You must be born again. I'm reminded in Acts 16, in verse 31, and they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved in thy house. Because they came to him, and they brought them out, and the, and the people there, or, 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 the, or, or the jailer, said, What must I do to be saved? And he said, Call on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. I have the freedom to worship God and to serve him. I have the freedom tonight from my past. I have the freedom tonight from my sin. And I also have the freedom tonight from death and hell. But let me tell you something tonight. Listen very closely as I close. If you do not know Christ, only one of those freedoms belong to you. Only one of those freedoms belong to you. And that is the freedom to worship and serve God as you please. But my friend, your past, you are not free from. Your sin, you are not free from. Death and hell, you are not free from. You are bound to that without Christ in your life. If you don't know Jesus, then none of those freedoms belong to you. Tomorrow on Thanksgiving, I hope that you will thank God for the freedoms that you have in Christ Jesus. I'm reminded in John 8, 36, and I close... If the Son thou for shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. Are you free tonight? And I don't mean to go to the fellowship afterwards for cookies. Are you free from your past? Are you free from your sin? And are you free from death and hell? Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for the word of God tonight. I pray.